You're listening to C-Suite Success Radio with your host and executive coach, Sharon Smith. If corporate success is your goal, C-Suite Success Radio offers you informative interviews with experts that will help you shorten your learning curve and accelerate your momentum to higher achievement. C-Suite Success Radio makes it simple and easy for you to tap into the wisdom of other successful business people who know the path you're traveling. If you're ready for success in corporate America, welcome to your new home at C-Suite Success Radio. And now, time for your host and C-Suite Executive Coach, Sharon Smith. Welcome to this week's episode of C-Suite Success Radio. I am your host, Sharon Smith of C-Suite Results. Each week we focus on success, a word we all know and something we strive towards, but not a word that's easy to define. All of our topics and guests are aimed to help you achieve the goals you've set for your organization and for yourself as a leader, but more importantly, to help you accelerate the pace of your success. On today's show, we have Brian Redler, an information security and risk veteran with more than 30 years of experience in these disciplines. Brian has developed, implemented, and maintained global risk, information and cybersecurity, and privacy programs for companies such as Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, and was the CISO and Chief Privacy Officer at Polo, Ralph Lauren, and HealthPlex. Brian is currently the president and founder of CyberNight Risk Management Consulting, providing services to assist companies in developing their security programs and also offering virtual CISO services. When Brian is not working to protect networks, systems, and data, he can be found on his motorcycle or playing with his grandkids. Let's listen to the conversation I had with Brian and learn how he defined success and the lessons he learned to help you gain the edge you are looking for. And I'm really excited to welcome Brian Redler to the phone today. Thank you for joining us, Brian. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, Sharon. Thanks for having me. So, Brian, tell us about you and what excites you, what gets you up in the morning, what drives you forward, and what you're working on. I've been involved in information security for over 30 years, since the mid-1980s, and it's an incredibly interesting field because it's a never-changing field. There's always new technology. There's always new business requirements that you have to worry about. The field has grown from data security to information security, disaster recovery, cybersecurity, privacy. It's just an always evolving field. And one thing that I find incredibly interesting is it went from a sort of a cost center for a company, something that a company just really need, felt that they needed to have, to right now it's, it can be a business differentiator for an organization. Every organization needs to have a good, solid, risk-based information security program that meets their regulatory requirements, their customer requirements, or just good security practices. That's one thing I've been talking about lately. My background, as you know, is information security. That's how we know each other. We were doing work together while you were at Polo, and I was consulting over there. We were working together on some compliance initiatives. And one of the things I've been talking about is getting back to basics and stop, not looking at all the technology or all the problems, technology problems, but looking at how do we get people back involved? How do we look at these as people problems? How do we differentiate ourselves or an organization from another organization? And how does an organization become a leader or have a competitive advantage through their people and how they attack and look at information security versus just what new shiny object and what technology is out there? What have you found that has helped the most to make an organization a diff- use information security as a differentiator? Basically, what an organization needs to do is really determine what their risks are, determine what their needs are, where their information is, what they need to protect, what regulations they need to meet, what's important in their industry and important to their clients. That's the first thing that they need to do. Then technology is an incredibly important part of building an overall program, but the reality is you could have the best technology in the world, but if the people in your company, if your staff, does not understand what their responsibilities are and their importance to the program, you're just not going to be very, very successful. So I think companies have started to realize that security is not a technology issue, it's a business issue. They need to train their organization, they need to make sure that they understand what they need to accomplish. And I think that they're finding once they're at the point where they've implemented a viable program where they can protect their information, where they could detect if issues might occur, where they can respond to them across their organization, they're really being able to be successful in talking to their clients, potential clients, that they can protect the information 
that their clients are giving to them. And that's just incredibly important today. That's true because many organizations are intaking, ingesting data from other organizations, and it's not just end user consumers. It's not just you and me and our credit cards and our social security numbers going to give it to one company that we entrust. It's what that company does and who they share it with. And from a business to business perspective, I can definitely see how that can be a differentiator when, especially with all the regulation out there when organizations right. have to provide data to other organizations and there's lots of regulation around what they're supposed to do, but you really don't know what they are doing at the end of the day. Right. And, you know, there's so many different kind of risk out there. There's operational risk, financial risk, security risk. But I would submit to you that all risk is reputational. Okay. That if a company has an issue uh, or a potential issue and it impacts their reputation, that is going to be the biggest issue that's going to impact them with their clients and potential clients. You know, if something might happen, it hits the front page of the paper and everyone sees it, and if three weeks later it's determined, no, it's not an issue, well, the retraction is on page 72 in eight-point type. Right. A, a company's reputation is incredibly important, and I think, unfortunately, we've gotten a little used to companies having compromises and breaches because it's happening so often, but it really can impact the reputation of, of a company. And you never know how bad that reputational impact could be just because Target and Home Depot and other big names are still in business. We don't always know what their financial impact was, and we don't always know about the organizations that are no longer in business. So we never know as an organization what the impact will be, and we can't assume it's just going to be okay at the end of the day. That is definitely correct. We don't know what the organization would have been able to do had they not had this problem. The fines these organizations are, are, are paying, what they could have used, those resources for the amount of time and effort they're putting in looking into the potential breach or the, the compromise, all those resources could have been used to build the business rather than to respond to an issue. That's really interesting. I've never actually thought about it that way before, but I think it's really poignant to think, yeah, sure, we're a billion-dollar company. We can afford the, the fines or we can deal with the impact financially, but what could that money have done to innovate or put you as even a bigger front runner if you hadn't had to deal with the response, the legal issues, the, the cost, and all of the investigations that went with it? I think that's an amazing point you just brought up. Thank you. I want to turn a little bit to talking about success in general. And whether you want to talk about it from the perspective of the work you did as in the information security or the work you do, I should say, in information security, cyber risk, and privacy, or whether you want to talk about it in life in general, it is whatever you want it to be at this point. Because when I bring guests on, it's about learning who you are and what we can learn from each other in these conversations. And I love what you just said. I've already learned something from this conversation today. Even though you and I have had many conversations before, that one thing you said just sparked something new for me. And I love that about these conversations. And I also love that we get to learn from each guest their definition of success, what that means for them, because too many people are using other people's definitions. So I want you to share yours, not because I want other people to say, ooh, I'm going to use Brian's definition of success, because I want people to realize they get to define success for themselves. How have you defined success up till now in okay. your life? Success to me is the ability to meet the goals you have set for yourself. This is both professional and personal. It's not goals that others might set for you. It's not goals that, you know, an, an industry, oh, I need to be in this job and I need to move up in this job and have a bigger office and a bigger title. It's what, are the, what are the goals that make sense to you? What, what are you going to consider successful for yourself? Some people are very much involved in their careers, and they would see their success career-oriented. Many people are involved more in personal issues and they would see those as successful to, to me it's really defining what your goals are and i think people should look and define their goals on an annual basis there should be short and long-term goals and these goals really you know I, I understand stretch goals and i think that's a great you know a great idea and you can meet your stretch goals you've been successful but the reality is these goals have to make sense. I mean, I could have a goal that says I want to be an inside linebacker for the New York Giants, which would be wonderful, except, you know, I could probably do that if I had the height the, and the athletic ability and the talent. But since I don't, setting an unrealistic goal is really going to impact your viewpoint of your success. So what I want to ask you is tell us about a goal that you had set 
whether it was career, personal, short-term, long-term, or maybe a stretch goal, a goal that you're really proud of accomplishing that really at the end of the day you said, wow, I set that goal and I accomplished it, which in your definition is success. Tell us about a time or a goal. If I will, I'll mention two briefly, one professional, one personal. The professional goal was sort of an ongoing one. It's the ability to define the information security technology in a business manner, in a manner that can be understandable to people at all levels of an organization. And I remember going to a company on my first week there, I sat down with uh, the president of the company and what he said to me was, I want to be 100% secure. I was able to explain to him that that's not possible. It's about 100% risk management. And I outlined a strategy and a program for him very, very briefly in a manner that someone who was an excellent business person but really didn't have any understanding of information security, how he could understand and understand what I was trying to do and understand the risks in a half-hour conversation. He accepted that. He understood it. And we worked very, very well together moving forward. Um, so I was able to basically, in a very short period of time there, about a half hour, change this person's mind from I have I have my goal which is we have to be 100% secure to something that's a little bit more realistic and how we get there so with that type of goal having the ability to define information technology for business users to understand them sounds like the kind of goal that would be continuous every time you have a conversation with a business user ensuring that in that conversation you're you're ensuring that they understand the technology and the ability and what the reality and the risk is. So it's kind of an ongoing goal, it sounds like. That is correct. And I mentioned a personal goal. My personal goal has always been that I've had a number of jobs where I've traveled significantly. And while I've enjoyed those jobs, a goal of mine uh, was always to ensure that I was home for all of my kids' major viewpoint, major situations, their, their birthdays, holidays, school events, uh, coach their teams. That to me was incredibly important. That to me, you know, defined success for me personally. And uh, in spite of all the travel I did, I was able to be home for all those occasions. So with a goal like that, being home for occasions and having to balance work priorities and work goals in addition to that, I like what you said with that because a lot of people don't look at values and goals and corporate values, I would assume that you have a high value for your family because you had this goal to always be at home for for family events and special occasions, which means if something work-related came up that could potentially keep you away, you had to decide which competing value because obviously I know you and I know you're a strong professional, has strong professional ethics as well. How do you decide between competing values or competing goals when they're both someone says I need you to be in Chicago this week because there's a major presentation we need you to talk to a board and have them understand this technology right versus my kids soccer game is this Thursday or their birthday is this Thursday I can't be in Chicago how do you decide between and those competing goals and values well you have to realize that it's not all about you you have a team of people you have a team of people that you're managing I understand there have been many courses and books written about map management, and they're all wonderful, but it all boils down to one thing for me. Um, if I were to teach a management class, I would say this one thing. The goal of a good manager is to make their people better. I've always been able to get my team involved in the business projects. It's very, very important to have a backup. So in some instances, if, if a situation would arise where I needed to be there, but I also needed to be at home, well, I would allow a member of my team, I would work with a member of my team, and in many cases, that member of my team would be able to go to that business meeting and do a wonderful job because they were excellent people, they were trained very, very well, and I would always be available for questions and comments, but it, it shouldn't be always you're the only one. It, it, if you're the only one who can do something, maybe you're not as, as successful as you think. I like that. It's very interesting and a different way to look at it. And it's all about removing ego. Oftentimes people do feel like, oh, I'm the only one that can do this, or they don't trust others to be as as capable as they are. And like you said, that's a potential issue in leadership and something to take a good hard look at if you are sitting around going, if I don't do it myself, it won't get done right. Right. You know, one of the ways I started to feel like I was a successful manager was when people I managed and work with started to get roles 
uh, equivalent to mine or in some cases have moved higher up in an organization, that's how I knew, hey, you know what, I'm probably a pretty decent manager because I was able to help these people. And again, I helped them. They, they did the hard work, but I was able to help these people that I worked with and I might have mentored to move forward in their career and be successful as they've defined success. That's really great. A lot of people, I think, feel competition when they see those working for them possibly rising above them, and you look at it as a success because you successfully mentored someone, and it shows that you yourself are a great leader because you have been able to lead these folks from a place where they might not have known the business or the technology or the situation to a place where they can then take the helm or take a different role and responsibility. Yes, I think that's incredibly important, and all managers should realize it's, it's very, very important to make your people better and work with your people. As much as I may have taught folks that reported to me, I've learned an incredible amount from them. That's really great. That's a great piece of advice. What other pieces of advice, what would you say to the next generation of leaders or even someone sitting in the C-suite today that maybe feels stalled and needs to make some changes, wants to do things differently, feels like they've kind of hit a wall? What, what's the best piece of advice that you can give them outside of what you just shared with us? Other than looking at what your goals are and determining if you are me- meeting your, your goals, your overall goals, it really is to, is to listen, to listen what's going on around you, listen to the people around you, and make a determination what you really want to do as a next step in your career. Are you in the right role? Are you handling things in the best manner? Do you fully understand the culture of the organization that you're with? But it's just very, very important to listen to what's going on around you. Companies, company goals, company relationships, people relationships are constantly changing. And unless you're listening to what's going on around you, things around you may be changing, but you may not be changing, which might be stifling your ability to move forward and meet your goals and be successful. So if someone is feeling stuck, it's a potential that, I shouldn't say it's a potential, they need to look inside and start to observe what's going on and listen to what's going on around them, probably start asking more questions. I find that we make a lot of assumptions in life, I know I'm guilty of this, instead of asking better questions and then listening to the answers. That is correct. And as you become more experienced in your career, it's much, much easier to take the attitude of, I've always done it this way, it's worked in the past, this is the way it needs to be done. And you don't realize you might have done an excellent job in the past, you're still doing an excellent job. However, there are many different ways, to, many different correct ways to do things, and things tend to change pretty rapidly in our, in our world. And you need to make sure that you're aware of that and you understand what's going on around you. That's a great point because if we think of a lot of the businesses that are no longer in business that were big businesses, we think of Blockbuster or Bed Bath & Beyond or Borders, that they weren't listening to what the market wanted potentially. They weren't listening and paying attention to what was happening. They just said, we're going to keep doing what we've always done and not really felt threatened by Netflix and Kindle and, you know, Amazon and all these other businesses that just came up with a more innovative way to provide a similar service. And that is a huge challenge for anyone in any industry. Right. And even at a more individual level, I remember I moved from one company to another. I had to design a technology solution to a problem. I had done it before in prior companies. I did it. I did it quickly. I did it in a manner that would have worked technically. And it was exactly opposite of the culture for the company I was now at. This was a number of years back. I learned a very, very important lesson at that point that there are a number of different ways to do things. You need to sit back and listen and make a determination of what is right for the situation that you're currently in. I'm glad you brought up culture because I think culture is so fascinating and interesting within organizations. And some cultures are very deliberate and created as the organization grows. And many cultures grow out of accidents, right? People just start acting certain ways and the culture is born. Tell us a little bit about some cultural differences that you've experienced over the years. You don't have to name names or companies, but I always love listening to and hearing about what we mean by culture. So when this is a great example. You said the culture didn't, you know, wasn't going to work or accept the solution you came up with that worked perfectly well at another organization. What was the cultural different or difference in that situation? Well, in some companies, the culture has hit the ground running, and you need to start making changes right away and you need to start really implementing solutions immediately and other companies it's more okay take six months 
meet the people here. It's more about relationships. Uh, and if you go ahead and you jump into the second company, type of company I mentioned, and all of a sudden you're looking, we need to do this differently, we need to do, do that differently, everyone's going to get defensive, you're going to get defensive, it's not going to work. And if you sit back and say, okay, I'm going to take six months to understand the relationships and what's going on here in the firm, but you're in a firm that wants you to start doing things, you know, we work 18 hours a day, we start making changes immediately, you, you're bring, being brought on board to make those changes immediately, you, you're not going to be successful. So you really need to understand how the organization works. You need to understand the people on your management team and your style. Some companies like to micromanage people, and if you're the type of person, and I'm this type of person, who really doesn't care to be micromanaged. And as a manager, I don't tend to micromanage my staff. If I do, it means there might be an issue. You really need to understand how the organization works, which is basically the culture of the organization, and make sure that you have an understanding of it. You've asked the questions on what's to be expected of you over the first six months. And you know, normally they'll say either, well, get to learn, know people, get to understand our issues, or they'll say we have these three problems that need to be handled right away. So it's really understanding how the organization works, how the people in the organization want to work with you. Do they view you as a team member who will help them? Do they view you as you're the expert, you tell us what to do? How much of that do you think can be determined before you accept a job? Because a lot of those situations, myself would be a great example. If I walk into a culture where micromanaging is the norm and that's what they're going to do, I'm going to have problems because I don't do well under micromanagement, just like you don't do well under micromanagement. How, how much of that do you think can be figured out before someone takes a job to ensure that they're going to be successful because they're going into an organization where they can truly thrive and be who they are and, and do their best work? It's not an exact science by any means. However, the same way that you're being interviewed for a position, you're interviewing the organization. So you have to make sure that you ask the appropriate questions. You need to make sure you see the appropriate number of people. I I know that uh, there have been some cases where I've interviewed with a firm, and even though there was an offer, I interviewed with one, maybe two people, and an offer was made. I didn't feel fully comfortable with that because I didn't feel I understood the organization. So I think you need to go in there prepared to ask questions, and you ask questions, even if it's you know the same questions of all the people you speak to, and you'll, I think you'll start to get an understanding of what it is. You can even ask what the culture is like. Again, I don't think people should be shy to ask questions when they're going on a job interview because you really need to understand how the company works. Now, again, it's not an exact science. You can go to a company and determine, hey, you know, I thought it was – I thought the culture was one way, but it really is is another. But I think you need to take the responsibility to research the company, however you can research the company. There's a lot of information out there about companies. And really ask questions during the interview process. And you can usually get a fairly decent understanding. I like putting the more empowerment into the hands of the, the candidate to make sure that when you're setting out for a new job, especially if one of your goals is to, you know, move into a management role or get into an executive role, or if you're moving from one company to another, more of a lateral executive to executive, making sure that you're asking good questions, listening, paying attention, understanding the culture, so that when you do get set up in the new company, you can, you know, hit the ground running in a proper way and and be successful and set your goals appropriately. And networking is incredibly important, too. If you're out there talking, if you're involved in organizations, if you're talking to people, if you have a good network either online or offline, as long as as long as you're not going to a completely different industry, you can probably get an understanding. You know, our industry, like in the information security world, it's not that big still. You can usually, by talking to people that you know, get an understanding of an industry, get an understanding of how a company might work. And it sounds like this is. Um This is the area where if you had known a culture before you jumped in, you would have shortened the learning curve. You would have been able to overcome obstacles faster. That's correct. And you may have determined, and there's nothing wrong with this, that that organization is not the right one for you. So when you went in and created this solution and it wasn't the right solution based on culture, was it the fact that you hit the ground running and they were a culture that needed more time? 
pretty much it. Plus, they used a little different technology than I had used in the past. So it just didn't quite fit the way the company was looking to do things. Um, I presented it. I quickly learned that maybe, you know, again, everyone was very polite about it. While it was a reasonable solution, it was not one that would work very well in this organization. I, I should have taken more time to understand the culture, to understand the technology, how things had been done. Nothing wrong with making recommendations on doing things a little differently. I really jumped in a little too quick. And this is all really great information, advice, uh, lessons learned, and that's the whole key to this. We can shorten our learning curve when we listen to others and learn from them. Don't fail or make mistakes unless we really keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and never get a different result. So I love the fact that we can learn from each other and that you can share your obstacles and struggles from the past and how other people can use that information to hopefully shorten their learning curve and overcome them faster. Yeah, I think that's something you really need to do. You need to learn from others. You need to look around you. You need to understand that even in the most um, competitive organizations or the most difficult of times, either personal or professional, uh, you're, you're not there alone. People have gone through this. People have dealt with these issues. And uh, it's important to speak to people. Don't just assume that you know everything. You need to speak to people and discuss with them, bounce ideas off them, uh, and, and really do what's best for your company and best for your personal situation. There's nothing wrong with having different options. There's nothing wrong with having an opinion and saying to someone, "This I'm not sure if this is the best way to go, but the reality is you really need to work with the people around you, either professionally or personally. It sounds like you're very passionate about the work you do, and I, I know by working with you in the past that I, I, there was a lot of energy that came from you. I enjoyed our time working together. What has been the most fulfilling part of the work you've done for the last 30 years or the work you're doing right now? It's a couple of things. Personally, it's keeping current with the technology. Since I started doing information security back in the 80s, things have changed so dramatically. I mean, you know, back when I started, the reality is there were mainframe computers. There was no Internet. No one thought about privacy. There weren't mobile phones. There weren't laptops. And the technology has changed so rapidly. It's really enjoyable to have to stay current with with the technology to always be learning something no matter how long i do this i'm going to be learning i mean i have no idea what the technology is going to be five years from now uh really i have some thoughts but i'm not sure but i'm looking forward to assisting and securing it but also we're still dealing with issues that we dealt with from a security standpoint 25 30 years ago which is incredibly interesting but on a personal level while I'm not putting this anywhere near at the level of a doctor or a lawyer or someone that's saving lives, but we're securing people's information. It's their personal information. It's their information, and they should have a say in how that information is used. And I just really enjoy being able to, to do that. I'm, I see myself as maybe assisting people. You know, I know that my, my family, I, the, the information about me, about my family, my children, and, and others in my family and my friends, that, you know, it's all personal information. And there needs to be ways to keep that secure, to keep that private. And maybe a little bit I'm helping to do that, and I find that very enjoyable. I agree. That was one of the pieces when I was working in the industry that was really fulfilling for me as well, knowing that what I was doing was trying to help secure organizations and networks and customer data and private information and um, make things make things a little safer for, for the good guys. What is your favorite book or subject when it comes to leadership or personal development? I always like keeping a list of what our guests are telling us they're reading or have read. I think a lot of people are always looking for new ways to gain personal development, and books are, books and audio are such a great and accessible way to do that. Yeah, I'm actually very bad along those lines. I love to read, but I don't tend to read a lot of leadership books or management books. Unfortunately, I tend to read a lot of science fiction. But I think sports book or something that really helped me define a role, a, a, a leadership role, and how I would want to be a leader. When I was a kid, there was a book written about the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s by um, Jerry Kramer, who was a right guard for the team. And he, and he wrote it about that season that the Green Bay Packers had, and I think that was one of the seasons that they won the, the um, Super Bowl. And even though it was a, I was a, a young age, that was really incredibly interesting to me because you had a group of people who had to work together for a common goal 
through good times and bad times, through winning games and losing games, through injuries, through personal issues. And I must have reread that book, I don't know how many times over my life. And it always really, really resonated with, with me because when you're working in an organization or when you're dealing with you, your family, it's really all about teamwork and working together towards a common goal. And I've, I've always found that a lot of these sports books written about team sports, if I would explain them in one sentence, it would just be that. It was about working together to achieve a goal and supporting each other. I would think anyone who was coached under Vince Lombardi would have a lot of great stories to tell about leadership and team because I believe it was 61 that the Green Bay Packers lost in the fourth quarter and won the following year. I believe, just because I was doing some research recently on Vince Lombardi. So it's just kind of ironic that I happened to have looked at that <laughs> recently. But I found what I was reading so interesting that I actually want to go back and read more about him, the coach, and, and his philosophies and leadership. So it's really fascinating that you mentioned a book from one of his, one of his um, team, you know, team members. That's, that's really great. And it's interesting, too, when we talk about sports, and I think sports can teach us a lot. If a sports team, you know, they pay their players millions and millions of dollars, if they ran like a lot of organizations r ran, that it would never work. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, corporations who have millions and billions of dollars on the line are trying to, you know, stay in business and do all these things with greater competition than any sports team. Most, you know, the NFL was, or how many teams? 12, 16 teams. Um, mm -hmm. There's not that much competition. They only have so many games a year. However, in business, your competition is everywhere globally all the time, but they don't look to the great coaches and the great sports teams for how to run a team or how to run a business. Well, it probably would run a little bit more efficient because if you're dealing with a sports team, you can only have so many players on the team, regardless of how successful you are. And Every person is very, very important. Every role is very important. And um, everyone needs to understand the playbook for the team, uh, where I think in a lot of corporations that's not the case. People don't necessarily understand the business goals of an organization. Um, they don't see themselves as important. I mean, one of the interesting things about information security is that everyone in the organization is important as everyone else because anyone can click on a link or anyone can answer a phone incorrectly and, or anyone can flip a switch, if you will, and all of a sudden the company is compromised. It doesn't matter if they're the CEO or if they're someone much lower in the organization. So I think corporations can learn um, from sports teams that every person in your organization is as important as every other person. That's beautifully said. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm glad you brought up sports because it is. It's a great place to learn how to be successful at, from a leadership perspective because we also know that coaches who are not winning coaches aren't coaches for very long. They are replaced. That is true. This has been so much fun. I appreciate your time today and your insights on so many things. I think we had a really great conversation and a lot of great tidbits. I always ask that our listeners find one thing. It doesn't have to be a lot of things. You don't don't try to implement too much or take too much away from anything. You can always come back and listen as many times as you want. But what's the one thing that you can take away from the conversation that Brian and I had and start to implement or think about or read more about? And I think there were a lot of really good nuggets here today, Brian. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sharon. It was my pleasure, and I enjoyed our conversation. All right. I look forward to more conversations with you. Take care. And I'll make sure all your information is in the show notes. So if anyone is looking for you uh, from a consulting perspective, because I know that's what you're doing now, they can reach out to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening today. Tune in for our next episode. And in the meantime, you can get more resources at www.c-suiteresults.com. Make it a successful day.